So what I'm going to do now is I present you the Commission proposal. The Commission proposal as it was adopted on the 16th December of last year. Um, I will not go into all the details of the proposal because of course we heard that we have dedicated sessions for most of the chapters which I'm going to introduce. What I would like to do is to give you a little bit background on the Commission thinking of it and also on the context in which we introduced this proposal. So I will start with the political and policy context. Why do we have a revision? I will go further on on the impact assessment and then give you, as I said, but only an overview of the main changes and I conclude with recent developments. But please be aware, I will strictly limit myself, of course, to the Commission proposal. Discussion in the Council, this is an other issues, but um, as we are here now, uh, what is very interesting, of course, for you to know is why and what did we propose in December. So, let me start with the why. It's a good question. I mean, we only had the Social Security regulation entered into force in 2010 after 10 years of negotiations and discussions, or even more if you think that the proposal for 83 and 97 was presented in 1998. So why do we need already another proposal? Good question. The reason is social security is not a frozen issue. It's a dynamic issue. There are developments in the labor market society, national social security system, and the case law of the, of the Court of Justice. We also have to be clear that what we proposed is not a big revision of all provisions of the social security regulations, like we did with 883 and 987. It is a targeted revision where we identified some issues where we thought that there is a need for further adjustment. So what is the general policy objective? Social Security was mentioned both by President Juncker and by the Commissioner Tyson in their introductory speeches also towards Parliament. The aim is to further facilitate the exercise of rights of citizens, clear, but also to ensure more legal clarity. And these are some of the red lines we will see which go through the proposal. Also, ensuring a fair and equitable distribution of financial burden. What does it mean? It means the idea that that country who receives contribution should in general be only also the country which is paying benefits. And of course, and I would call it an evergreen on the goals, administrative simplicity and enforceable of the rules. Remember when we discussed the old set of regulation, this was the big issue, modernization and simplification. If we have reached simplification to a degree that we don't need anymore, well, it's up for you also to judge. But this is one of the goals also of this vision. So simply said, the, the rules, the aim is the rules should be clear, fair, and enforceable. What is really new with this proposal? For the first time, we were undergoing a full-fledged impact assessment. So far, we were already, I call it, spared the impact assessment arguing that this is a proposal, these are proposals which are necessary, which are not optional, but the rules agreed between the institutions have been more strict, have become more strict, and there are basically no exception anymore. So also our proposal went to a very extensive impact assessment process. This was very challenging for us, and I can tell you it took us many months of work why is this challenging? Because the data situation is not optimal, to say it at the least, in the social security field. We have in some areas only sketchy data, in some areas nearly no data or not comparable data. So we needed a lot of work also with the help of the member states, of the administrative commission, external contractors. 
to establish an impact assessment. The impact assessment was, of course, only done with regard to those elements of the proposal which have a new impact, which have changes. Those elements of the proposal which were only clarification or improvements of the current rules were not subject to an impact assessment as were some smaller technical uh, changes like the entries to annexes of the regulations. You find everything online, particularly the executive summary. It's available also in all languages. What is also new for us, but what is typical now to an impact assessment, is that we had to go to an independent board, the so-called regular scrutiny board. And this scrutiny board, as the name say, was scrutinizing our impact assessment, whether or not we had uh, scientifically valuable and correct analysis of the available data, which led to conclusions of options which are scientifically proven. And they were very strict with us. We had to come back a second time because they wanted to have more data. But we passed this board in January 2016. Uh, we had also, and this is also required by the uh, impact assessment process, a structured consultation process. Of course, with member states. Here we use the privilege which we have in this field that we have an administrative commission where all member states are present. So we had with them internal uh, extensive uh, consultations, of course, on an informal expert basis within several years. We had dedicated meetings with social partners, with NGOs, and we had two online public consultations, one in 2013 and one in 2015. We are continuing also these consultations. We have another consultation with social partner end of next month, on the 29th of June, by means of an extraordinary meeting of the Advisory Committee on Social Security Coordination, where we will also again discuss with social partners our proposal. So, what were the main changes? And here I say in particular the changes where we had a look whether or not we should make a change. Of course, uh, the reason of an impact assessment is not that you should decide immediately what you're going to do, the purpose of an impact assessment is to develop options so that the political decision maker, and in this case it's the commission as a whole, so the whole cabinets of all commissioners, can make an informed decision which option to choose. So we looked at the area of unemployment benefits. Here we had promised member states during the last negotiations or during the negotiations of the last amending regulation 4.65 of 2012 that the Commission will have a look at the whole chapter of unemployment benefit. We were looking at the field of access of economically inactive citizens to social benefits. Why? Because here there was a lot of new case law where there were calls that clarification is needed. We had a look at long-term care benefits. This was an issue where there was no new chapter uh, agreed during the last revision. We looked at family benefits very openly uh, because a number of issues were raised in this field and of course also on the social security rules for posted workers. You probably know that initially this was a package which was called labor mobility together with the revision of the posting of workers directive. The two proposals were split. Why? because our proposal was delayed due to the discussion on the uh, UK settlement in February where there was a provision with regard to also to Social Security. So our proposal was delayed until uh, this issue was clarified. So, let's start. Unemployment benefits. Briefly, the proposal says the period of exports of unemployment benefits should be expanded to a minimum of six months with the possibility to prolong it until the end of entitlement. What is different? At the moment it says you can have your unemployment benefit 
paid out in another member state for at least three months with the possibility to extend it to six months. Why this, in particular, as in the impact assessment, uh, we identify that still the chances of receiving, uh, 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 or of gaining a new job is higher in six months, within six months as within three months. And of course, given the uh, inequality between unemployment rates, this was considered as one of the tools to mitigate these differences. But on the other hand, we are also proposing a stronger cooperation mechanism between member states for controlling and verifying these job seekers. The proposal includes, includes a mandatory obligation, a mandatory uh, uh, reporting obligation of the receiving country meaning that if a person is coming to another country, this country has to report every month to the country paying the benefit about the progress of the unemployed person according to the rules applicable for unemployed in the receiving country. Then we have a second aspect with regard to unemployment benefit, which concerns aggregation, the adding together of insurance periods. Why this, the current regulation, actually is not absolutely clear. As a general rule, insurance periods are added together for benefits when they are needed to fulfill a waiting period. We know this for pensions very well. There's one specificity with regard to unemployment benefit. The regulation said before you can add together, you need insurance in the new country where you work without saying how long this is. So clarification was needed. Clarification was also needed in the sense, how long would it take to establish a link with the new country? So our proposal includes a requirement that a person who comes newly to a member state should have worked at least for three months before he can use the principle of aggregation. However, this does not mean that the person will end up in a limbo if he becomes unemployed within the first three months. If the person becomes unemployed during this time, it's the previous member state who continues to be responsible for unemployment benefits. And the last major part of unemployment benefit concerns the whole issue of frontal workers. As you might know, at the moment, we have a system that is in principle the country of residence who is responsible for the payment of unemployment benefits for frontal workers. Then there are specific rules for other cross-border workers. These are workers who are not returning home usually every week. Um, we have also a reimbursement mechanism in place for the amount of three to five months. But in particular, the reimbursement mechanism does not work properly. The reason is that there are different interpretations of member states what it should mean. And there are also calls saying, okay, why should one member state receive the contributions? And only with a small reimbursement, the member states of residence has to bear the costs. So our system makes makes a closer link, and this, what I said, is the red line, fair burden sharing, that the country of employment is in principle responsible for the payment of unemployment benefits for frontal workers if the frontal worker has already worked for 12 months in that country. 12 months is the period of stability of link to the new labor market and should also exclude that, for example, seasonal workers are falling uh, immediately under the legislation of the state of employment. Uh, within the first 12 months, the rule remains the current one. It remains the country of residence, which remains responsible. Yeah, then we have the very famous issue of access of in economically inactive citizens to social benefits. Here, of course, that's to be very clear, our intention was not to change anything. It was to 
incorporate, clarify, codify, however you want to call, at least parts of the case law we received with regard to the access of these persons, also to benefits falling under the Social Security regulation. Why this? This is very important, of course, for the clarity for citizens. If they read the regulation, and the regulation reads you have full equal treatment, and then they refused benefits on the basis of a case law, which is referring to another EU instrument, which is the free movement directive, this, let's say, at the least doesn't lead to clarity. So, therefore, we have incorporated in our proposal part of the case law, which is in particular for the experts, Commission versus UK, where you can make access of inactive uh, persons subject to the condition of having had legal residence. And these legal residence criteria are defined in the Free Movement Directive as having sufficient resources as not to impose a burden on the host state's finances and as having had comprehensive sickness insurance. What we have not incorporated was the case law with regard to job seekers, in particular the cases Alemanovic and Garcia Nieto, because we considered it not yet to be stable enough to codify it in this proposal. Another chapter where we, or new chapter where we had a look at was the issue of long-term care benefits. As some of you know, at the moment, long-term care benefits are, according to the case law of the court, treated as sickness benefits. This has some advantages, but also some disadvantages. The disadvantages is that, in a certain way, they do not really fit under sickness benefits, and it makes it extremely difficult to apply the overlapping rules we have in the regulation, where I can deduct accumulation of benefits in cash and benefits in kind. The list at the moment only says if, mem if member states have them or not, but it doesn't specify what they are, because we have no definition. So what we therefore propose is to create a new chapter on long-term care benefits with a clear definition and ask the Administrative Commission to draw up a list of these benefits. But otherwise, everything remains the same. The coordination under the rules of the sickness chapter continue to apply. Yes, family benefits. One of the important things in this chapter is not only what is included, but what is not included. So we had a long assessment, assessment of whether or not to include, of course, uh, an indexation to family benefits. Uh, as you know, this was one of the agreements in the settlement with the UK of February 2016. But here it was also clear that all the head of states and government said that this would only apply if the UK notified the outcome of a positive referendum, which obviously did not happen. So this was off the table, but we still had a look. But we found out, of course, that the savings or the changes to the actual amount of benefits were relatively low compared to the cost of increased administrative burden in calculating family benefits and updating then according to shifting indexes. And for political reasons, of course, if we say on the one hand in the posting of workers directive that you should receive equal pay for equal work, we also say that in social security you should receive equal benefits for equal contributions. What was updated was a smaller issue with regard to child raising allowance. There are now no longer a right for the family as a whole, but individual rights. This gives member states the option to pay them also in full to both working parents. Then another very important part of the proposal are the social security role for posting. 
Um, here also we did not propose a substantial change to the rules, but an enforcement and a clarification on the existing rules. In particular, with regard to the issuing, withdrawing of the PDA one certifi certificate. What we also proposed an alignment of the terminology concerning posting. At the moment we have a difference what we call posting under the posting of worker directive and of what is posting under social security. Under social security also self-employed can be posted, which is not post possible under the posting of worker directive. Under social security also persons, workers who are moving to another member state or who are posted to another member state or sent to another member state without an employment contract are called posted under social security but they are not posted workers within the posting of worker directive. So we proposed that also in social security you only call posted workers who are really those under the posting of working directive and the others are called sent workers or self-employed. As I already said, we propose clear rules for the issuing and withdrawal of the portable document A1 and the stronger, stronger cooperation with, clear, with also clear deadlines and consequences. An alignment of the replacements which we have already in place for workers also to self-employed and also um, an alignment of the safeguards we have for posting that when you refer to an undertaking, the undertaking has really to uh, have uh, an activity in the country where the place of business is. Also with regard to the constellation of persons in working, working in more than two member states. At the moment, the rules there say that the worker is in general subject to the legislation of the country of residence if he or she pursues at least 25% in that country and then it's the country of the place of business. But here by the place of business there's not this qualification that the undertaking really has also to perform substantive activity there. And we also propose new implementing powers to the commission this sounds dangerous, but it is not. <laughs> so what, what we propose here is because we, we notice that we need a number of implementing measures which are currently drawn up by the Administrative Commission. These are the famous decision of the Administrative Commission. But we all know, according to the Court of Justice, they have a limited legal value. Huh? The court is clear, they don't have the same legal value as a legal instrument. Even so, the court acknowledged that you have to recognize forms and so on. And with the new implementing powers to the commission, if it is so wished as an additional tool, yeah, certain implementing provisions can be lifted up at the level of legislation and therefore become legally binding, in particular in the field of posting. So, we have of course other amendments. Uh, amendments in the field of recovery. Here, uh, Regulation 2010 introduced a new chapter based on a directive in the tax field, which is already working. What happened in the meantime? The tax colleagues updated the directive. So we have also, of course, tried to adapt it. What is very interesting here in the field of tax, you have now a uniform instrument, a uniform EU instrument to enforce measures. Huh? which is quite unique and apparently works very well there. So we propose also to use it in the social security field. Then there are more standardized procedures for requesting and so on. And the offsetting procedure is also extended to cases of retroactive, retroactive changes in legislation. Other amendments. We have a number of measures to facilitating fraud and error as regards exchange of personal data. That means uh, in the regulation, member states will now have the legal basis to exchange more data based on, uh, let's say, evidence or suspicion of fraud and error. Uh, at the moment, it's only possible 
to exchange individual data and under the new, uh, under our new proposal, uh, an extending data exchange, of course, with, uh, within certain limitations is possible. Then we have changed, of course, a number of technical issues coming from the administrative commission and we have, of course, the changes to the annexes. And here we propose also for the future to give new delegated powers to the commission to amend the annexes. This is also not something very dangerous because we have it already for a part of the annexes, which at the request of the administrative commission can, changed, can be changed by a commission regulation. Why is this useful? It becomes more and more difficult for political and other reasons to propose changes or amending regulations to the current regulations at the interval we were used to. If you look in the past, 1408, we nearly had every year an amending regulation, which took care in particular also of the annexes. This will not happen in the future. However, national legislations don't stop changing, so we need to find a mechanism which is quicker to respond to these changes. So we propose that all annexes can be changed by commission regulation if they had been before discussed and agreed in the administrative commission. So what is now the future? We have a famous joint declaration of the council, parliament and the commission. And in their wisdom, they said that this is one of the priorities for 2017, where progress, if not, a, if not uh, an agreement, should be reached already by the end of this year. Yeah, I'm not commenting on that, but it's a fact that this declaration was made. And this declaration is also monitored in several meetings where we were given scores how far we have been advanced, and there are a number of technical meetings on that, just to keep this also in mind. Um, of course, the proposal was transmitted then to the Parliament and the Council. The Maltese Presidency has already discussed certain parts of the uh, proposal and is also aiming for these parts to come at least to a partial agreement uh, during the presidency and then of course the future presidencies will follow up. We have also transmitted our proposal to the other committees, the European Economic Social Committee, Committee of Region and the Data Protection Supervisor. Under the new rules there is also a transparency register where everybody was allowed, particular citizens to provide feedback and we were undergoing a subsidiarity check so from all the parliaments which gave uh, feedback, we received only one negative feedback. And this is different to our colleagues who are dealing with the posting of worker directive, which got the yellow card. Yeah. Um, what is also to uh, bear in mind, until the proposal has gone through the legislative procedure, council and parliament, the current rules remain in place. Uh, so there's no preemptive application of certain rules possible. The current rules are staying in force until we have, hopefully not too late, and I see also representatives of the future presidencies uh, adopted the proposal. Thank you very much.